that note, I'm now just going to introduce the session. It's called Bibliomania. It's presented by the Rajasthan Patrika. On stage, we have Nadeem Aslam, Cyrus Mistri, who a lot of people thought was from Tata Industries. So I would like to clarify that Cyrus is not from Tata Industries. Carsten Jensen, and they will be introduced by Meeta Kapoor. So Meeta, it's on. But we are here today, um, the festival organizers have sent out an adversary, there is an infection which is virulent, spreading, and it's important to infect all of you. I've, hopefully it's infected all of you already, because I know Nadeem here, Cyrus and Karsten have already surrendered and succumbed to it. It's bibliomania, it's the obsession to own and acquire books, that's the dictionary meaning. and. Um, Nadeem, as you all know, is from Pakistan, Cyrus, in spite of the Tata persona, is a very fine writer. <laughs> and Carson has joined us here from Denmark. Um, all different genres of writing, they will speak about their books eventually. But uh, right now, since it's about loving books, basically, um, I'd like each of you, uh, however you want to start speaking, is each of you carries a book in, or many books inside your head. There are characters that have kind of, you know, made their nests inside your mind and heart. Mm. There are authors that you look up to. So if each of you could tell us which are the books which are the most precious to you, which really impacted your lives, which are those authors, which are those characters whom you carry always with you. So how would you like to start? Nadim, would you start? Um, yes, um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, well, I grew up in Pakistan, I now live in Britain. Um, and uh, one of the central things uh, that I learned uh, as soon as I became able to walk, talk and see was that there was a book and my mother was a believer, so she had the Quran. So every day she would sit down and look into this thing and she would go to it with a certain frame of mind. Before she approached it, she would wash her hands, she would kiss the book, she would then open it and afterwards she would be in a purified state. She would feel that, she was, that her soul, her breath had been purified so that she would actually call us nearby and she would breathe on us. The, she would breathe that purity onto us. Mm -hmm. So very early on, one of my most vivid memory is that something happens to you when you read. I didn't know what she was reading, but this object which opened at one end, that, and then you looked into it for a while, I don't know what she was doing, uh, that it did something to you. And as I grew up, of course, I learned that, it, that, it, that this was a sacred book. Um, and um, uh, people talk about... Um, when uh, in the West people talk about the Quran and it is inaccurately said that um, um, that uh, it is the equivalent of the Bible in Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't, um, strictly speaking, in that um, the Bible is uh, uh, that uh, in Christianity it was Christ who was God made flesh. But in Islam, it is God made word. So the equivalent in Christianity is actually Christ himself. That is the equivalent of. So, so the idea that books were sacred, that came to me. And secondly, when I began to read the idea of stories, the basic stories that I knew don't tell lies, don't cheat, don't, which I still use every day, the journey I've taken to come here. Those are the earliest stories that were told to me. You know, there was a prince who lied and there were, and, and there were bad consequences for him. And, um, uh, and beyond that, as I grew up, the idea of politics entered into it. Um, uh, I mean, um, uh, the Iranian novelist Mehmood Dawlat Abadi was arrested in the 1970s during the Shah's regime. And when the police when the secret police came to pick him up, they said, and he said, why are you arresting me? Mm. And what, what have I done? And they said, 
you haven't done anything, but everyone else we have arrested seems to have your books. So we've come to arrest you as well. So I think every author should dream of getting arrested. As so, long as people are buying their books. Exactly. So to say what I get from books, I mean, it is a very long journey. I can, as, I've, as I hope I've just explained, that you begin, I began with a sacred book. Beyond that, I moved into stories. And I think stories have an evolutionary advantage because we keep telling ourselves same stories again and again for thousands of years. And it is because um, it is a way of binding a group together, finding out what is the correct behavior which will make this tribe cohesive enough so that we can remain alive and to move on to the next generation. So food is important, air is important, etc. Et but stories also are important because a kind of wisdom is being wisdom and knowledge is being imparted onto you. And beyond that, I mean, there's a historical impulse, there is a, um, um, a political enthusiasm, and enthusiasm, and of course, aesthetics. So we could, but I'm not going, going to like. What about you, Cyrus? What, what would you like to say about yeah. the books that you mean? Uh, I think uh, I'll start with a remark which... Uh, you need to Graham. be louder. Okay. You need to be louder. Yeah, yeah, we've told him to be like, yeah. relax. Uh, no, I'll, I'll start with Graham Greene, once remarked. Okay. Hello. Yeah. He once said that it's only in childhood that books have this very deep, they, they make a very deep impression on you, the books you read in childhood. And he say, went on to say that later in life we are willing to be entertained, we, we are willing to learn things from books. But most of the time, we are only absorbing what is already in our minds, you know, already in our heads. Uh, and he went on to say also that it's only in childhood that books have that kind of books. All books are books of divination, which tell you, like the fortune teller who reads your cards, that uh, he said that, you know, whether, like the fortune teller who tells you that whether you're going on a, a long journey, which is dangerous for you, or you, there's going to be death by water, and so on. You know, the, the books have that power to influence you deeply only in childhood. You know? mm. And this is, uh, I thought about this and I thought it's very true because uh, books do make that deep impact on you in childhood. And one of the things it does is, is it makes you want to be a writer if, if books have really excited you and uh, gripped you in some way. I mean, some, some people uh, have had that experience. Some people have been successful as writers. Some haven't. Some have, you know. Uh, uh, my own father, I was, I was very fortunate to be born in a, in a house, in a home where my father himself was a kind of a writer, though he, he sort of, uh, his considerable talents were expended in writing copy for, for an advertising agency. Uh, to meet the family bills and he used to write letters to the editor and so on and uh, he also used to write short little verses to uh, his sweetheart which, who was late, my mother you know, later so so but the great thing was that in our home the all the arts were totally revered you know books especially and music and so on but uh, his own grandfather owned a bookshop, apparently. Somehow there was some kind of uh, apocryphal story about how he was uh, in himself, the grandfather was cheated of that bookshop, you know, and uh, my, my dad didn't like to talk about all these things, so we just had it, knew about this in a very vague sort of way. But all that apart, I mean, books have been very important to me because uh, I think uh, I started from a very early age to, f to feel that I had some, some the, the, the excitement they conveyed to me was very strong. And uh, I did think of writing, you know, my own little stories and things at a quite a young age. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, I, by the way, I must apologize, I'm a very poor speaker in public and I might have to refer to my little notes. Uh, just to uh, 
this, uh, this, uh, this. Which are the authors which have yeah, actually kind of that. Yeah. stuck in your head? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. No, no, no problem. Yeah, I think as a child I, I read everything. I was completely om omnivorous and uh, indiscriminate in the way I read. But uh, one thing which I found was that I was very attracted to plays. You know, I found that plays had the ability to uh, condense emotion, you know, to, to create raw emotion in the conflict between characters and between situations. And I found myself very naturally kind of being able to write dialogue. You know, and so, so in fact, when I was just uh, out of uh, school and, and in, in college, I wrote a play called, it, it is called Dungaji House. And this play was, uh, I entered it into a comp competition for playwriting, which was quite a prest prestigious sort of international. Yeah, it won an international award also. Yeah, I didn't expect it to, but, but it won the, the first prize in that award which was rupees 5,000, a uh, very considerable sum in those days. This was in 1978. And uh, yeah, so that in a way sort of started me off, confirmed my career for me. I thought I would keep writing. But in fact, that play was not produced for 10 years after that. So what you're saying is that your reading led you to writing? Sorry? Your reading led you to writing, basically. Yeah, yeah. At a very early age. Sure, sure. Kasten, did something like that happen with you as well? Or yours is a different journey altogether? <coughs> Mine is a, is a different journey. Does the microphone work? I, no. There's a sound. <coughs> just no, my, mine is quite a, a different journey because there wasn't many books in the house where I grew up. My father was a sailor and absent most of the times, but when he was at home, uh, he, cons he was, let, let's call it, a militant anti-intellectual. He considered everybody who ever read a book for parasites. You have to work with your hands, oh. and indulging in books was a waste of time and a waste of everybody else's money. Um, I had a mother who was uh, quite depressive, and she sometimes sort of sought refuge in books to get away from the world. And I was, to complete the childhood picture of my miserable childhood, I was suffering from asthma, which is physically debilitating uh, and means you're excluded from the company of other boys because you can't participate in violent plays, you can't play football, you can't do this or that. And that meant for me the alternative world that I created for myself was books. And I have this very vivid memory of the first time I ever managed to read a book, which was just a little children's book, on my own, because it still stays with me as a kind of example of what literature is. And this was an evening where uh, I had been left alone. My mother had, believing I had fallen asleep, had left the house to visit her sister a few blocks away. Um, and. I woke up and realized I was all on my own and I was dead scared from the darkness and then I turned on the light and that didn't help because I was still alone and I started reading this little book and for the first time ever I read a book from one end to another and it was a very small book and I was maybe s seven years old and I then realized that my I was not afraid anymore. The darkness, the loneliness meant nothing. It was as if the book was light in the darkness. It was as if somebody was speaking to me. Uh, there was, even though it was just a book, there was a human presence and I was no more lonely. Um, and, and somehow that experience has followed me ever since, that I, I see novels, literature as the presence of another human being as the invitation to enter somebody else's life. Also to be somebody else than who you are. And in this way I, I see it as a way of having a much richer life, of trying to be many different persons, trying to be a person living in another century, 
an old man or a young man, a woman, a child again, whatever. Um, and somehow that I, I can give you an example of how it stayed with me, that experience. I was in January 2002 as a journalist. I was traveling in Afghanistan and this was just after the fall of Taliban. And I went there just to see what the Afghans thought of this dramatic change in their lives. And I had been in Kandahar and I had guides bringing me uh, from Quetta in Pakistan into Kandahar. But when I then went on to Kabul, nobody wanted to go along with me. I was on my own and they had found a driver and a car and he spoke no word of any language I could understand and I spoke no word of any language he could understand. Even the basic English words of yes and no were, we were mutually uh, mute. We couldn't communicate. And uh, we were driving all day, and um, there were times when the, the landscape became a bit monotonous. And maybe I was also with repressing my nervousness, because we had been told, I had been told, you must reach Kabul in the same day. And I could see there was no way we were going to make it, because the roads were all eroded or non-existent, and we weren't driving uh, very fast. And there was a time, strangely, while we were on this bumpy road, I brought out a novel and started reading it. Um, and this was a novel by Saul Bellow, the American writer, called Ravel, Ravelstein, which is about in, intellectual, intellectuals in New York and about uh, a gay anthropologist. And it was as far away from Afghanistan as anything could be. And somehow I could feel it calmed me down. I was uh, in the presence of this mysterious mute driver and in this totally alien landscape and whenever there was a sign of any kind of human presence it had been shot to pieces, it was bridges that had collapsed, it was burned out vehicles and so on uh, and then all of a sudden there was this soothing presence of somebody else there who wasn't mute, who was talking to me. Uh, and I think that for me somehow sums up the experience of, of literature. And I sometimes question myself, could I live without writing? And I don't know the answer. But if I ask myself, could I live without reading? I know the answer. No, I could not. Take away books from me and I'll be a goner in a short time. Nadim, you mentioned a sense of worship when you approach a book. Is that still something which is very much a part of your being? Because a book is supposed to be uh, changing you, changing your way of life, moving you, disturbing you. Is there any such or many such books that you hold close to your heart? Um, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I write books and I read books and I almost consider what I reading and writing to be a sacred thing. Absolutely. And it is in a way what I do, I feel um, part of my obligation as a human being to in a way to um, however successfully or unsuccessfully document my time that, uh, that I've been given this span of time. I wish to uh, not just um, talk about the beauty of uh, that I'm that existence is, and I do think being alive is a beautiful um, uh, phenomenon, uh, but also the injustices. Also, the I, I, I spoke earlier, and um, so absolutely, um, there are writers. I mean, Czesław Milos, the Polish poet, is very important to me. I believe I think about him at least once every hour, I believe. Um, uh, but I mean, we can go back to any number of writers. Ondaatje is important, Faulkner is important. And I can tell you why they are important, because, but we don't have enough time. But um, it's very hard to cleanly try to find out what your influences are. Uh, the other day when I was working um, in my study, I wrote a sentence, um, which was that a character says, um, 
Um, I'm not like God who can watch the suffering of those he claims to love. And the other person says, so you, so you, so you think God doesn't care? God is just watching it, w watching all of this just um, at a remove? And I don't know where they where it came from. I'm not religious. I'm an atheist person. And yet this response is a religious one. Somebody is saying, and I, and I assume it goes back to the religious people in my life. I'm not religious myself, but there are people in my life who are. And uh, to go back to what you were saying earlier um, about childhood, you mentioned uh, that uh, time of our life when, when the dew is still on the earth. When, when we are new, the day is new. Um, um, yes, I mean, I, I began writing when I was 12. I published my first short story in a children's magazine when I was 12, and it was in Urdu. And between the age of 12 and 14, when we left Pakistan, I, I wrote 27 short stories, and they were published. And, and I um, made a scrapbook of, of all the of all those 27 stories and I glued them into it. But when we left Pakistan, we left under, um, uh, under difficult political circumstances. My father had to flee. So I left my uh, scrapbook behind. And uh, over the last 30 or so years, I've often wondered what happened to my uh, scrapbook. And earlier this year, I went to the Lahore Literature Festival. And a really sort of an, an elderly gentleman approached me when I was signing books, and he said that you don't know me, but we are distantly related. I am an uncle of your cousin, and etc. And he said, I have something for you. And out of his bag, he brought out this book, which I immediately recognized as my scrapbook. And he says, Do you know what this is? And I said, Yes, I know what it is. I was so shocked that I, I said, can I please look at it? And he said, well, no, 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 this is yours. You can have it. And, and I looked at it, and I took it home to England, and I've now photocopied it and made and have it photographed, everything. And I can tell you, and this, that's the point I want to make. There is one short story which I wrote when I was 13 years old, and it is just three or four paragraphs just a, like a very terse fable. And I can say this because it is no longer me. It is so brilliant. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, <laughs> that I am now going to make it into a 300-page novel. It is like a really like a Saramago novel. And it's like being given a gift by my younger self. It's, uh, so, so that was the point I wanted to make. And the point I wanted to talk to you uh, to come back to you, when you said that uh, you had a house where there were books and the feeling for the life of the mind and the arts, but you didn't. And I had a bit of both because my mother's side are very religious, deeply religious. So uh, my uncles on my mother's side would say, why is he writing? Because, because writing is a form of lying, if you think about it. This didn't happen. Why is he doing So it was discouraged. Why are his stories being published? Why is he writing? That they, but on my father's side, they were saying, oh, how great he's writing stories. And so Shema Sini, who unfortunately left her earlier this year, the brilliant, beautiful poem by him, he says that two buckets are easier carried than one. I grew up in between. So, you know, so that is, so in a way, I love that tension um, of, of coming from a place where on the one hand, somebody was telling me, go right ahead and write, and the other person was saying, what are you doing? Um, so you, it's been a win-win situation in that sense. Sorry? It's been a win-win situation in that sense for you. I mean, we are fortunate at least that scrapbook came back to you. <laughs> yes, yes. A, so, That's such a yes. beautiful story. Cyrus, do you have any such interesting nuggets in your experience? Uh, or, or maybe because you seem to be a very reticent person. You know, the, the image of a typical writer who just wants to keep to himself and write. I think you, if I'm, I'm maybe overstepping territories here, but you seem to belong because I was going through your website and reading up and trying to read your book as well. 
you are one of those people if I'm not wrong. So what yeah. when you are reading, which is that cozy corner that you choose, where, which is where you lose yourself completely into the world of books? Yeah, I, nothing makes me happier than, than I mean, as a, as a, again, as a kid, I mean, when we were in school and so on. Just hold it closer. When we were, when we were in school, uh, a rainy day when you didn't go to school, you could just uh, curl up in bed with a blanket and read. I mean, nothing gave me more pleasure than that, you know. And uh, even now, I mean, the thing is, uh, writing, if I'm actually writing, I'm, I'm, there's nothing that could make me happier than just to be able to sit and work and concentrate on that, you know. When the writing is actually flowing, it's, it's, it's an exceptional sort of feeling. But uh, if one tries to define exactly what is this pleasure one gets from writing, you know. And because maybe we are all in some way in this society, in the modern society, we are all becoming kind of, to use a cliche, sort of the world is becoming more global day by day. So perhaps the pleasure, the real pleasure which writing gives you is because it allows you to enter into universes you didn't know existed, you know. And that is very important because for every writer, I think the, the cliche, he should avoid cliches like a plague, you know. Uh, because uh, stereotypes are, are not uh, something that lead to, unless it's deliberate for some reason, hmm. uh, that lead to any kind of uh, good writing, you know. Hmm. So, any sort of... Uh, I, I, I know I'm drifted away from your question, but... Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, that's all right. See, whatever you're telling us about your writing and the fact that you want to lose yourself while you're writing is, is, is something yeah. which I think each one of you, when you are in that little space where you are writing, I also wanted to ask you, Karsten, uh, how often do... You know, there are books that we hold, we, we've read and we kind of they sit on our bedside tables because they're uh, forever for us. Uh, how often do you tend to reacquaint yourself with those kind of books? Do you go back to rereading them? Do you get that kind of time? And I would like actually both of you to also speak after after Kasper says this. Well, there are books that I there are books that I revisit, um, like every three or four years maybe, that I know somehow are the determinate books of my life. But, but I was now listening to the, the stories of how you become a writer, how you discover the writer in yourself. And I actually discovered the writer in myself in quite a negative way. Um, at first I wanted to be a painter, but realized I didn't have the talent. Then I went through university studies, finished them um, after too many years, and realized I wasn't cut out for the academic environment. And so I, f I knew I l writing was the, what meant everything to me. But I also felt it was a kind of last option, that I was good at nothing else. It was a kind of almost negative definition of myself. You cannot have any other kind of life. So your last option before you end up in the gutter, that is to just dedicate yourself to your writing. And for many years, I didn't see myself as a writer. I wrote two novels and when I look back at them I don't see them as very good novels. I felt I didn't have the real ambitions. Um, and, and when I uh, wrote the, the novel, that is the reason I'm invited uh, here for Jaipur, We the Drowned, um, it was also a kind of almost uh, choice decided by necessity. Uh, I wanted to portray a little town on an island in the Baltic Sea and follow life there through several generations. And I did a lot of research and I thought it was fantastic material. And, but if I really had to unfold its potential, I realized I could only do it in the shape of a novel. And that scared me because I didn't think I was cut out to be a novelist or that I would be a good novelist. So again, it was kind of last option. But, but you know, when you ask where does inspiration come from, there is a little anecdote I read by a, a Danish writer that's not being translated into English, so you don't know about him. But uh, he grew up in the countryside. He had no mother. He had a father who was an alcoholic. He worked from he was five or six um, as a cowherd in the countryside, alone with big cows and bulls. I think uh, a story that some 
Indian people living in the countryside would recognize. It was quite similar. Um, and then he tells the story, why did I become a writer? Was it because I was inspired by this life in a primitive agricultural society? Was it because of nature or my life with these big cows, these big creatures that I learned to dominate and handle? No, he said, it was because the food that I brought every day, my lunch, was wrapped up in old newspapers. And I started reading the newspapers. I became, it was as if it was the written word and my encounter with it that made me a writer. And so, of course, it was also the ex spectacular experiences of his life. But primarily, it was this old newspapers full of grease and whatever uh, that his lunch was wrapped up in. And, and I think that's a wonderful picture of how, of the many sort of sources of inspiration. But I also think that what happens when you're writing, there's a lot of control in writing. There's a lot of control and discipline in finishing a book. Mm -hmm. But on the way, there are also these moments when you have to give up control, be able to give up control. And I often had this experience, I watched my hands, my fingers, um, playing the keyboard. And I'm looking at the screen as if somebody else is writing there. And I'm asking, what are you up to? Where does this come from? And I cannot answer that question. But these are the real happy moments of writing. There's a lot of unhappy moments. I think there are most of the unhappy moments. But there are these little rewards when all of a sudden your fingers, dictated by you don't know whom, acquire a life of their own. Yes, I mean, um, there is a state of grace which one enters before you make a work of art. I mean, I get up in the morning, well, I get up at night, I sleep during the day and I write during the day. Okay, sorry. There is, as I was saying, there is a state of grace which one enters before one makes a work of art. And you don't really know what happens in that. It sounds very mystical. Um, and I apologize for that. but. So when I arrive at my desk in order to work, everyone in the world is in my study with, 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 with me. Everyone on the planet is there, all of you, all of you out there. But as I begin to work, slowly people begin to leave. And eventually, an hour later, only I am left. And I'm, I have to say that eventually I do leave. That ultimately, the work itself is the only thing that is creating itself. I too am not there. Um, and um, there is a term called um, paradoxical undressing, uh, which means um, that, um, that people who freeze to death are frequently found naked. It is because when you reach the stage of acute hypothermia, the mind convinces the bodies that you're actually burning up. So you begin to take your clothes off, and that hastens the death. So for writers and, art and artists, um, the danger is because the blank page is so frightening and it's so mysterious, we don't know what goes on there, that you frequently want to walk away from it and you know, engage with the world in a, in a sort of meaningless way, when you actually should be sitting there and trying to create. You know, that is the danger we writers have to um, uh, be, be aware of. And to go back to what you were saying about the writers that I go back to, I mean, um, and what do I get out of writing? It's just, just like, I mean, um, I was looking at Proust just the other day. I just, you read a few pages of Proust and literally he rewires your brain. Your thought patterns change. You're actually thinking in a different way. And books allow, to me, the kind of books I like, they allow me to exist outside conventional ideas. That they are um, making another thing possible. They're saying that this too is a possibility. And um, you were saying, what are the books I go back to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you know, so, uh, there are great contemporary novels I go back to. That I, I'm just thinking of, uh, and why I go back to them uh, uh, is precisely what I said earlier. The, all of the things that politics, history, aesthetics, um, it's all, 
so various kinds of nourishment. I was thinking the other day about um, Arundhati Roy's great novel, The God of Small Things. And there's a one, do I have time? I mean, okay, uh, okay um, I, I can stop. No, no, that's fine. Just finish it and then we'll go back to okay. Cyrus. And, no, we can go uh, back to Cyrus. No, finish what you were saying. It's fine. Oh, um, and, um, there's a moment when um, the lead character, Rahil, marries an American man and, and moves to the States for a while. And, um, uh, and he's, he's her husband, but he doesn't understand that she goes through these moments, he, uh, that she has these moods or, or these states of mind, and that she has a look in her eyes. And Arundhati Rai says, he put it somewhere between indifference and despair. What he didn't know was that in some places, like the country that Rahil came from, various kinds of despair competed for primacy, and that personal despair could never be desperate enough. That something happened when personal turmoil dropped by at the wayside shrine of the vast, violent, circling, driving, ridiculous, insane, unfeasible, public turmoil of a nation. The big god howled like a hot wind and demanded obeisance. The small god came away cauterized. Nothing mattered much, nothing much mattered. And the less it mattered, the less it mattered. It was never important enough because worse things had happened. In the country that Rahil came from, poised forever between the horrors of war and the terrors of peace, worse things kept happening all the time. So think about it. We have everything in this paragraph. Yes. And who in this room doesn't need these words? We do. You know, it's, uh, so that is what you get out of books. And that is why you go back to books, to actually remind yourself of what it is to be a full human being who has a responsibility to, to himself, but also to everyone else out there. Cyrus, any such book? Any such book that you go back to? Something that will really move yeah, you like I've this? I've always, for one thing, I have to correct this uh, impression which I've probably wrongly given that I was uh, from the beginning just I knew I wanted to be a writer and so on. I was in fact training to be a musician. I was a pianist, and I wanted to be a, in the Western tradition, uh, classical tradition, sort of a composer. Uh, but I, by the time I grew up, uh, went to college and so on, by that time I had given up this idea because I found, found I was probably just too lazy to practice enough and it was a very rigorous thing, you know, discipline. So, but uh, anyway, so then later, I mean, I started, I wrote that play and I went on writing and so on. I became a journalist in Bombay and so on. But uh, what actually started me off uh, when I wrote these first two novels, I was already in my uh, uh, middle ages, sort of, I was past 40 and uh, I was diagnosed as having a serious illness of the nervous system and at that point I, I just thought to myself, it's now or never, either I, I, I write or I don't, you know, and, and when, after I wrote that first novel, I, I never looked back, I thought, okay, this is, I, I had found myself in some way, you know, but the, in terms of the people I always go back to, I was very deeply influenced by uh, Dostoevsky and Chekhov and, and you know I mean a lot of people are so there's nothing sort of novel about this disclosure but uh, the thing is the very odd thing is uh, when I discovered that Milan Kundera who's also a very great modern writer he has he says at one point that he can't bear to read Dostoevsky you know and uh, he was in, at one point in Prague he was penniless because he was uh, you know politically ostracized and so on and and uh, somebody, a publisher, thought he'd give him a chance to earn some money and he said, make a uh, play, a stage ad adaptation of The Idiot. And that's when he made this uh, remark that uh, he could not stand Dostoevsky because of his uh, murkiness, because of the emotional, emotionality of his uh, world, you know. And that in his world, emotions acquire the status of truth and uh, reality, you know. And, and he said, I could not relate to that. But in my own case, whenever, in fact, I am trying to write and I get stuck completely and I can't, I feel I've reached some, some sort of block. It's, it's somebody like Dostoevsky who, who is able to move me so much that I'm able to start writing again, you know. Yes. Yeah. Karsten, we are living in an age where we are, we are, when we are in a bookstore and we are buying books, which is to read. But then you have the internet, you have the e-book. 
Has that taken the joy out of collecting books or has only uh, enhanced it further? Because each one of us is reacting very differently to, you know, holding a book in your hand and the smell of the paper and the joy of just <coughs> reading like that or you're okay with reading on the screen on your tablet. So are you buying as many e-books and are you still comfortable with the hard copy? How is it that you've reacted to these technological changes? Well, the answer is very simple. When it comes to these technological changes, I'm a kind of Stone Age man. I never bought an e-book in my whole life and I don't intend to which is very inconvenient when you travel as much as I do because most of my luggage is always books and they weigh a lot um, and my wife just travels with her little Kindle and I drag my suitcases along she looks triumphantly at me uh, <laughs> as this dinosaur she mistakenly married who belongs in another age um, but returning to this question of, of writers we return to and there's also this my favorite book that I keep returning to is the one I got when I was 14 years old and I read it back then and you can tell from the copy that it has been read for so many years and that is um, it's a Danish classic um, which was recently after 94 years after it was published in Danish it was translated into English uh, <laughs> and was uh, greatly reviewed in London Review of Books. And it's, it's a writer called Pontopidan, who later on got the Nobel Prize. And uh, the title is Lucky Peer. And when I spend my time introducing you to it, I'll do it briefly. It's because I think it's about something that is becoming more and more um, urgent. Uh, it tells the story of a young man who comes from the deep province, from his father is a priest, from a religious background. He comes to the big city, to Copenhagen, the capital. He becomes an engineer, a symbol of the new secular, industrialized, modern society. And he is, looks as if he's going to win the whole world. He has it in his hands. He gets um, a woman from a rich family. All door opens to him. And all of a sudden, he turns it back on all of it, resigns from all of it go to the remotest cor corner in the countryside and lives a very modest life. But he does not return to the religion of his father. He remains a secular figure. But what is he looking for? Uh, and the answer, the novel keeps asking this question, who am I? And of course, I was sucked into it when I was a teenager, because that is the question you're asking yourself all the time. Your body is asking it because you're changing. Who am I? What is going to become of me? Uh, and I think that is the essential question of literature, of the novel, that it poses that question. It does not give any answers, but it poses it so clearly and beautifully that we can all identify with it somehow, that question of identity. And I think right now, where we live in this era, globalization, it's becoming a more and more urgent question to all of us, because the life of this character in this novel, uh, moving from the countryside, uh, going to the big city, trying to work out who you are and what to do with the possibilities offered to you, is the question of, I'd almost say, billions of people in these years, where so many people, just look at India, are leaving the countryside behind, where they hold an ancient, thousand of years old came, culture intimately connected with agriculture, is somehow collapsing and especially collapsing in the cultural way where all these answers that were given for millenniums who am I? You knew who you were, you knew where you belonged but we don't know anymore we are on the lookout for new identities in a way this uh, word that comes from political debates uh, and countries in turmoil and crisis, maybe even war. We talk about eternally displaced persons. But I think that when it comes to our identities, we are all becoming internally displaced persons, um, desperately and sometimes dangerously looking for answers to these questions of who are we? So are you both comfortable with 
handling e-books because there is a disconnect. You know, it also is, I think, partly generational uh, because I work with a team which is half my age, and they're all very happy to just read e-books. And if I give them a manuscript to read, they look at me as if I'm from outer space. So that is one thing. But would you buy e-books happily? Or would you still carry bags and bags full of books and still mull for hours inside a bookshop, take in the musty smell and, you know, the romantic part of buying books <laughs> is something which I think we people do hold close to our hearts. So are you comfortable or are you still um, thinking on? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I always read with a pen. So I have to underline things and I make marks. So my books are, by the time I'm finished with them, more or less unreadable by anyone else. They are literally, there is another layer of text gone into it. And I can't do that on an electronic yeah. uh, device. Uh, so that's the only reason. Um, uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so not with me. Not for you. Uh, no. What about you, sir? Yes. I've never bought it. Not, I mean, I, I'm, as you can see, I'm, I'm not at all. A, I'm not, I'm just too old for, uh, I mean, I can send emails, but that's the extent of my, <laughs> my familiarity with computers, you know, really. And I don't want to get more into, because technology rules our lives in such a way and it's so invasive, uh, even, even with cell phones and things, you know. I mean, I, for a long time I resisted cell phones because I didn't want somebody calling me up every now and then, you know. So, uh, so a tablet is a far thing for you, that means? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. But you know, to go back to your point, um, and the ironic thing is that uh, people are looking for new identities, people feel lost, as a, and yet the ancient stories, Homer has something to say about the time we live in. Yeah. The Greeks so do just, have something to say about it. Not just the ancient stories, the identities issues that he's brought up is actually a Exa relevant part of each of our existence exactly, right now. Exactly. So Kalidasa does have something to say about about two, about 2014. It's just that, as I said, we're not looking in the right place, and we are, we we seem to be forgetting that we need to connect with our past, and we do that through stories. We do that because with childhood we connect back to the stories that our grandmothers told us, mm. our mothers told us. See, because mm. and I think India is basically a country where we come from an oral tradition. The stories are just mm. in our systems because we've been told stories ever since we were children. Mm. You know, that's the way we all have, I think, I'm, I'm presuming yes. even you must have grown up like that. Mm. So must you have grown up. I think this is why when we, sorry. Go. No, I, I was just a little remark because you usually say that uh, prostitution is the most ancient profession. But I think storytelling is just as old. And I think also it will be the last profession before we all disappear as a species. That will be storytelling. Yeah, that's, that's really true. I think with, uh, with that, we'll open it out for questions. I'm sure all of you have enough questions to ask our speakers here today. So who's doing the? OK, I've been told. Okay. Four questions. Nadim, you said uh, that one story you wrote when you were 13, you're making that into the next novel? Uh, no, or I think it's um, down the line. Okay, down the line. What about the others? Will we ever see those? Um, they will at some point, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to carp a bit with uh, the authors. You are creator of words, so you have discussed books only with words. But a lot of people get introduced to books with pictures and uh, stories. So we can't hear you very clearly. I'm sorry. Can you address your question directly to the person you want yes. an oh, answer well, from? In general, with all the authors. Okay. What about books with pictures, books with uh, interactive works, books with even equations for the mathematicians? You have an interest, but those also attract people to books. And it can be a very, very strong attachment to such mm. books. Actually, this point came up uh, when I was here last year, which is that the um, uh, that now you have that at some point um, on an electronic de device, if the um, reader, uh, if the narrator mentions a piece of music, 
you can press a thing and yeah, the piece an of music will come it's out. It's an enhanced ebook, um, yeah. I mean, first of all, that kind of thing in, an, in a non-electronic form has always existed. I, I remember being 13, 14 and picking up a book in which is at the end of a ch chapter it says, now you have a choice to go to page 35 hmm. or you have the choice to go to page 25. It depends which strand of the story you want to follow. So it is quite interactive. That So that is interesting. I don't mind that Calvino, Italo Calvino wrote Could any be. number of stories in which he said, you, you know, it's up to you how you will read them. I'm not intimidated by that and it's interesting. Second thing, uh, the thing about having pictures, the thing about etc. I think if the prose is good enough, you will hear the music in your head. You don't need the piece of music. If the prose is good enough, you will see the image vividly in your mind. You will not need to see the painting. Um, so, um, so yes and no. But I mean, There's a couple of more questions, I think, somewhere. I, I would just like to add something. Yeah, I totally agree that if the prose is good enough, you don't need yeah. to press any other buttons. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think actually what you're, what you're asking for is actually, as we speak, being played out in many video games, uh, that there are kind of more and more elaborate stories, and mm -hmm. they, you can choose met paths, and it's about your own skills and your own choices and so on. So I think story-wise, there's a new, very interesting world developing there that we shouldn't just dismiss as commercial. That's, that's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if I have to give my opinion on this, I mean, for me, all this is just clutter, clutter you know? I, I don't really endorse this kind of thing, you know? Maybe you can have a good graphic novel and so on, but I'm not being attracted to reading those things, you know? It's just a personal, old-fashioned kind of approach. Uh, because there's been, I mean, this whole question of, uh, we were talking about identity before, you know, that the, the question of identity politics, you know, that people tend to, there's so much multiplicity of things in our society, and at the same time people are getting kind of uh, espousing identities which they cling to, you know, so that so-and-so is a kind of, you say that he's a uh, oppressed Dalit, or he's, uh, this fellow is, is an, uh, fanatical Muslim, or so and so, I'm a Parsi writer, you know. So, these are things which we need to break, you know, rather than to uh, get uh, entrenched in and, and cling to, you know. And that, that literature will always be how freshly you can say something, whether it's the freshness of a character or speech or a description. Uh, you know, the, the mold has to change, you know, it, it has to be totally fresh every time, I think. That's true. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, this is for Nadeem Aslam. Um, I love the character, the mother in the book, Maps for Lost Lovers. Uh, she was just heartbreakingly beautiful. And I just wanted to know if there was an autobiographical element in that um, characterization. She was, her faith made her so brutal, but you treated her with such tenderness. Hmm. Um, give, give me your take on that. Well, um, I didn't hear part of the question, but I vaguely know. Uh, well, um, uh, you're referring to the character of the, the mother character in my novel, Maps for Lost Lovers. Um, with me, um, how I made that character, people always ask me, well, I know women like that. I know men like that who are believers and, uh, and, and they can't see beyond their belief. And, um, uh, but as a writer, then it becomes a challenge in that um, as a novelist, I have to tell you that for me, there is no such thing as just a beggar. I have to go in there and have to tell you the entire story. If in my novel, I present to you just a beggar, I have failed in my duty because it, it, it is my job to actually make that person as rich, vivid as I am, as as. As, as the people who seems to, who are not beggars are, if you know what I'm saying. So this was a person so removed from who I was. But uh, a novel is a democracy, first of all. There are technical challenges you have to understand. A novel is a democracy. I could not have had five characters. Among them was the believing woman. And I made four characters to be full, fully developed. And that one person, to be weak because the reader would have felt it. They would have said, yes, but what about her childhood? You, you, you've told me about the childhood of these 
four people, what about her? What about her youth? What about her? What kind of clothes does she like? So I actually have to step out of myself in so many ways to say that I don't like this kind of person, but because he or she is in my novels, I had better do because otherwise my novel will be damaged. It's, it's quite selfish in a way that I have to understand people so that, so that my un understanding of that person doesn't damage my novel. And beyond that, you have to understand people. I mean, uh, I see I, I write, I mean, there are words like, is this what I write? Is it um, literature of compassion, literature of consolation? All of that, fine, that is what it is. But compassion and consolation and commiseration, they're all another word for love. And that is what the attempt is in my novel, to actually do that. One last question. A quick one. Um, two parts to it. One was, what is the name of the book that you just mentioned, the Danish book that has been translated in English? Yeah. And the second part is that my son and I, my 13-year-old, uh, is an avid, avid reader, and we're always um, sort of having a debate about fiction versus nonfiction. And how would you um, recommend, because you know, I know that the fiction gives them the narrative, but the nonfiction gives the background information. And so how do you and create a child to do, be doing both. Um, well, the title of the novel, that's what you were asking for, right, is based on the name of the main character. Um, and in Danish, he's called Happy Peer. Peer is his name. And in English, it's become Lucky Peer. Um, and your question, I'm not sure I quite got it because I couldn't hear it so well, but was it about the differences between fiction and non-fiction narrative and... Oh. Well, I'm not the right person to ask because I have a daughter who is now 17 years old and I've spent the last 10 years trying to persuade her to read books, uh, whether they be fiction or non-fiction, and I have utterly failed. I cannot get her away from the screen. So I unfortunately have no good pieces of advice to give you when it comes to that. I just hope that one day she'll find her way into the world of literature on her own. And I sometimes fear that maybe it's because I'm a writer that she has chosen to Not chosen free. other paths, that this is, I am too domineering in her world already. And then does she have to sit down and read not only daddy's books, but other similar books? Thank you, but no thank you. <laughs> That's a very ironic note to end a session on the love of books on. But thank you so much, all three of you. Um, we'd, uh, they're available for book signing. I'm sure the most efficient Teamworks people will tell you where they'll meet you for book signing. And enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Meeta, and thank you to all the other panelists for an extremely interesting session. Uh, we